All right, guys, the last lecture or two, we were focusing on building our WPF applications. We neglected the PowerPoints. We're going to go back to the PowerPoints. So we were around the point where we were talking about how to declare a variable, where you give the data type, you give the variable name, and you give it a value. So a variable has three components, a type, a name, and a value. The equal sign copies the value from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. That is opposed to the double equals, which in just about every language we've seen is a comparison. If my age equals equals 25. I'm expecting y'all to have had a previous programming language where you're already familiar with the difference between single and double equals. So the first time you give a value to it, if you do it in the same statement where you declare it, it's called the initialization. Otherwise, it's just called an assignment. If you want to display a variable, you can use the function right line. Notice they do this using static, static system.console. They do that so that they don't have to write system.console.writeline every single time. So let's pop open Visual Studio just so that we can play with these things as we look at them on the PowerPoint. Let's just make a console app. I mean, you can't really develop WPF applications online. Okay, yeah, that's true. You can uh, develop console applications. I'm sure that there are WPF, uh, excuse me, C Sharp console application creators. Okay, so file, new project. It's a C Sharp app. So other languages, Visual C Sharp, Windows. This is just going to be a console application. Let's give it a better name than console one. Let's just call it September 6. We're going to come back and we're going to do a tutorial, you know, an, an actual tutorial after we lecture for a while. But for now, that'll work. Let it turn for a while. It will build us our file with our boilerplate. We don't really need any of this stuff except for system, so I'm going to delete all of the usings except for that one. And then if we go back and we look at their code, here's, whoops, that's not the code. Both those icons are uh, red. They did using static system.console. If we don't do that, we're going to have to type in static.console.writeline. I really don't mind typing that. But they declare a variable, and then they write it out. Let's do that. Double, which is a floating point type, some money is equal to, I only have $3.45 in my account. Now, system with a capital S dot console with a capital C dot right line. Just that money, 3.45. Nope, I mean the variable, not the value. There we go. So now I'm ready to build it, rebuild the solution. That worked. Now I'm ready to run it with the start. And we forgot something. We forgot the little bit of code at the end that causes it to pause. System.console.readLine. We don't even have to store its results anywhere. That's just enough to get it to pause. All right, and there we see our 3.45. So 3.45. All well and good. Let's try what they're doing. Using static system dot console. That means that if we want to use read line and write line, we don't have to 
All right, I'm getting errors. Let me go back and see what the PowerPoint looks like. Interesting. It could be that this works on a later version than the one that we're using in the classroom. Identifier, expected, static is a keyword. Okay, I'm going to take that out. I was wondering about that static. I was, uh, I was unfamiliar with its use in a using statement. Okay, so using system.console, that way I could come down here and I could remove the right line, the, excuse me, the system. No, I can't. All right, forget that. Forget everything I said there. I'm going to have to go see and what's going on there. Since we've already done using system, we can leave the system dot out. So the suggestion is, can we do using system dot console? And then come and just do right line and console. Nope. All right. We're going to live with typing console.writeline and console.readline. That's my preference anyways. Apparently something has changed in newer versions of it. You might be able to get it to work on, on yours, Adrian, but I can't. So, no, you're using, everybody in here is called currently using uh, the 2013 version. I'll have to do a little bit of research there. So right line displays some information. If you don't use the word line, if you just use right, it doesn't go to the next page. Excuse me, the next line. So we could do this. Console.write, I'm putting this above my right line command. Some money equals, like that. And then when I run it, it's going to say some money equals, and then it's going to be followed by our variable. Some money equals 3.45. I can put a space there to make it a little bit prettier. All right. It'd be nice to tell them what we were doing at the end. So above that console.read line, I should do a final console.write line that says press enter to continue. Or press enter to quit. Something like that. Rebuild solutions, start, there we go. Some money equals 3.45, press enter to quit. We had already seen how to do this on day one when we did a hello world, but then we went to WPF applications. So we're looping back to it. So here's what they're showing is they used a right to say the money is and they put on a dollar sign. I forgot to do a dollar sign. I could tack that onto my program. I could go, okay, some money equals dollar sign and then print some money. Good enough. The format string. I believe we talked about this on the second day. When you're printing things out, you can use a format string which has placeholders. The placeholders indicate what is going to be displayed at that place. So we don't have to use two write statements to print the money is and followed by another write statement that actually prints it out. We could write a nicely formatted string like this. The money is dollar sign, and then we have a placeholder zero. And I know we covered this. So I'm going to delete these two console.write line statements. And replace that with, did not mean to bring that up. I wish it wasn't hard to do on. Replace that with the write line that has the placeholder. So console dot right line parentheses the money 
is dollar sign followed by a curly brace followed by zero indicating that we're going to use the first variable end curly brace and then we need to pass in the variable we want to print out which is some money Build it, run it, and there. It says the money is dollar sign three dot four five. And we could keep going. We could add more placeholders. And I need, you know, another amount, you know, <laughs> whatever the second amount we were gonna ask for. You know, we could keep going with other placeholders. Let's do that just for giggles. The money is dollar sign zero, and I need that much. And since on my screen I've run out of space, I'm gonna put the comma here followed by the value some money and then followed by another value which is going to be you know I need a lot of money like that there we go and we can keep ch chaining placeholders and unlike Java you don't use plus signs there to hook up everything you're printing well you do if you use the print F statement in Java so this is the equivalent of printf, effectively, Java's printf function, if you're familiar with Java. How do you limit the, uh, the size, or I guess how many numbers after the decimal? I knew you were going to ask that. Sorry. I'm, uh, I'm psychic. I've forgotten. Let's go look. take a stab at it. Excuse me to pause while oh, you have to put it in the bracket. Yeah, so the question was how do you format it so that we get two decimal places, which would be nice since it's money, right? We want it to say exactly nine 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 point zero zero and right now it's not. Right now when we run it it's just saying nine 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 nine. We don't see the sense. We don't see the sense of that. So we're gonna tack that on. So where it says curly brace one in curly brace, we're going to do curly brace one colon F standing for floating point two, meaning uh, we want two places after the decimal point. So I'm guessing right line can handle how many arguments? <laughs> oh, right line, you could. Yeah, the question is how many uh, items could you stick in right line? Uh, I would assume, you know, dozens. I don't think there's any reason for them to have limited it. So capitalization doesn't matter? At which point? Did we have lowercase versus uppercase F? Does capitalization matter there? Well, I did, and it was fine. Okay, that seems to work. Uppercase and lowercase F doesn't matter there. If we go and look at our PowerPoint here, they seem to indicate that you can use either one of those and uh, I don't see a difference being used. Okay, so you have a whole bunch of format characters. If you use C, it's gonna print it as a currency. C would have been nice for us to use rather than F, and then we wouldn't have to specify the number of places. So if we say, print that as a currency, zero colon C curly brace, and then print this as currency, zero colon, C, or one colon C brace. It ought to be formatted nicely, and it has a dollar sign already in it. So we could change our code a little bit to remove our own dollar signs. And there we go. And presumably it's uh, doing some kind of check to see where we are. And since we're in America, it's going to print a dollar sign. And if we were in England, would it? Yeah, I don't know how you would change the environment so that it would know to print, you know, francs or euros or, or pounds or whatever. Okay. But really for the most part, rather than doing the currency, I'd rather stick with the uh, F because we're not always going to be printing out dollars, right? You know, average rainfalls and stuff like that do not need dollar signs print, 
prefixing them. So I'm going to stick to using colon F and specifying my number of decimal places. Just that whole colon business just amazes me how it reads in between those brackets. And like you're looking at that whole string, but it still knows what's in between the brackets and what to do. Yeah, yeah. This syntax is considerably different than it is in the C programming language and in uh, Python's formatted print and in Java's formatted print. It's kind of neat. Say you want to change the order of these things. You could go, okay, this is going to be my first placeholder. And this is going to be my second placeholder. Now that's wacky, but you could do it. And then it'll say the money is 99000 and I need 345 Okay, that's cool. Or you could just print out the first placeholder over and over if you wanted to. You know, curly brace zero, curly brace zero. That's kind of neat. I have 345. Yeah, so Microsoft did something kind of neat there. But this syntax is a little bit different. So once you've, you know, you've already accumulated knowledge in your head about you how to do it in uh, Python and C++ and, uh, well, not in C++, but in the C printf statement or Java's printf statement, now it's different. Got to learn a new syntax. So when you're printing out your values, when you're displaying your values, this is cute, right line, I have this much money, this much money followed by several exclamation marks, this much money followed by more exclamation marks. They just use the placeholder over and over and over. See that right line zero, right line zero, right line zero. Same, same placeholder over and over and over. You can specify the width if you want. So inside the placeholder, you can use a comma followed by a number to specify the width that that's supposed to take up. Did you tell what the value right here? <laughs> I did, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. I want eight spaces here. So what I did is I had a comma eight there, and that didn't work. There we go. So I wanted the first placeholder to be eight spaces wide, and I want the second placeholder to be ten spaces wide. So what I did is curly brace. 0, comma 8, that means 8 spaces wide, and fill in F2. And for the second one, I made a com um, 1, comma 10, so curly brace 1, comma 10, so it was 10 spaces wide. We'll use that when we're trying to make things print in columns. Are you usually going to want to specify the width of something that you've printed? Not really. So I think I'm going to take that out. I think that it's making the syntax a little bit harder to read. The goal is not to make the code maximally difficult to read. Just know that you can specify the width. So inter integer data types store whole numbers. As we saw several days back, there are all sorts of different integer data types. You have bytes and you have signed bytes. A signed byte, you know, is one that can go negative and positive. An unsigned byte is one that has a maximum value of 255. A signed byte, you can go down to negative 127 or so, and you can go up to a positive 127. You have a short and an unshort. Unsigned short. An unsigned short can contain a maximum. It's the, a byte is an 8-bit data type. A short is a 16-bit data type, meaning that it has 65,000 different possibilities. An int is a 32-bit data type, meaning that it's got about 4 billion different possibilities. And a long is a 64-bit type, meaning that it's got, you know, nine quintillion different possibilities. Some huge number. And so if it's got a U in front of it, it means it's the unsigned version, which gives you a larger range positive you can go to, but with no negative values. And then care. So variables of type int are whole numbers. They're integers. In my mind, unless you feel a really strong need to use a byte or a short, just use ints all the time. You know, they go up to 2 billion. That's probably going to be enough. And if 2 billion isn't enough, use a long. 
The only time I would fuss with something like this is if I had some absolute need to create a number that was just going to be a single byte long, like I wanted to create a file that was a series of bytes, I might want to you know, create an array of bytes so that I could fix those directly and then write them out. Also, I just about never use the unsigned version of something unless I know I'm never going to need a negative value. A floating point number has decimal places. And it's got a mantissa and an exponent. So some of the bits are de dedicated to the mantissa, the number before the decimal point, and then the rest of it is devoted to the exponent itself. That's the, the wrong way to, to phrase it. So um, if you got a mantissa and an exponent, you're familiar with the syntax 1.3 you can't read this, this is too small, times 10 to the power, you know, of 32, something like that. Let's make the, uh, the font a little larger. This is the mantissa. This is the exponent. So we could rewrite that as 1.3e32, right? So in a, uh, in a long, excuse me, in an int, you know, we had up to like 4 billion or so different possibilities, a positive 2 billion and a negative 2 billion, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We had about that many digits to play with. In a float, we have about the same amount of space, but only some of them are dedicated to the mantissa, and some of them are de dedicated to the exponent. So for a float, the first seven digits, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, are dedicated to the mantissa, and then the last three are to the exponent. So we could do 1 point, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then the exponent could be, let's say we were trying to store this number, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4. We wanted that number, so we said float f is equal to that, and we prefix we suffix that with an f to indicate that it was a floating point number rather than a double. So all well and good. What this gets stored as is 2.345678. That's seven digits times. Now, what does our exponent need to be? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So e to the eleven. Notice what happened. We lost some we lost some accuracy, right? We were we only had room to store that many places. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. We lost all of the rest of this data. It's the same magnitude. If we printed it out, what it's going to display is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, zero, 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 zero like that, rather than. rather than that. You see what I mean? So a floating point in some ways is not precise, as precise as an integer. But if you think of precision as meaning decimal points and stuff like that, yeah, it's way more precise because an integer can't hold, you know, you can't have an integer that's equal to point, oh, 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 you know. And you could do that certainly in floating point. Okay, that's a little bit too computer science-y, whatever. Let's go back to the uh, slide here. The flow can hold up to seven significant digits of accuracy. So that's a, a besides the exponent. A double is much better. It can hold 15 or 16 significant digits of accuracy. It uses twice as many bits, so it can hold much larger numbers. The mantissa can be much larger, and the exponent can be much larger. And then the decimal can be 29 significant digits. A whole bunch uh, very precise, suitable for financial and monetary calculations. If you need to make a number of float in your code, you tack on an F. If you need to make a number, you can tack on a D, but you don't really need to do that because that's the default data type for literals in C sharp that are floating point. If you want to make a money, a decimal value, you suffix it with a capital M. And if you want to, you can use E for exponents inside your declarations. So C Sharp tries to display floating point numbers in the most concise way it can. But
but you can specify other ways of displaying them with our floating point value formatting types. Fixed point was F. If you want to display something as scientific notation with an E, we could do that. For grins, let's go and try that. Let's change our code here to display our money in scientific notation. So, did we say it was E? So, the first placeholder says curly brace 0 colon E, and the second one says 1 colon E. And there we go. We have 3.45 to the zeroth exponent dollars, but we need 9.99 to the fifth exponent dollars. All right. If you like seeing that, that's great. Do I usually like seeing exponents? Not really. I'm going to change, I'm going to undo those to get them to be F2 again, each one of them. 0 colon F2, 1 colon F2. So, arithmetic operators. If you've taken other programming courses, you know what these are. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. They follow the rule of PIMDAS, you know, parentheses, and then multiplication and division happen at the next priority, and addition and subtraction happen at the next. I guess I'll write some notes up just because I really want you to, to know this stuff. So, I don't recall if there's an exponent operator in C sharp. There is? Well, in C sharp, I have no idea. All right. So, So parentheses are the highest priority. You use those to group parts of the expression that need to be evaluated before anything else. And then you have multiplication and division as equal priority below that. And then you just solve those left to right. And then you have addition and subtraction, which are then equal priority but lower than multiplication and division left to right. So if you have... 10 plus 1 plus 2 times 3, or you have 10 plus 1 times 2 plus 3, what are those equal to? Well, we have to do this stuff first. It's in parentheses. And then 1 plus 2 times 3. Multiplication and division have a higher priority, so we got to do that first. So that's 6. Added 1 is 7. Plus that, 17. How about this one? All right, what gets done first? The multiplication. So 1 times 2 is 2. We have 3 to it. That makes it 5. So that's 15. It's never a bad idea to use parentheses to force, to, to let the user, uh, not the user, just to visually indicate what's going to happen first. So in this case, right here, As super programmers, we know that the 2 times 3 is going to happen first. But we could do that anyways, right? That really reinforces the idea. Is it necessary? No. But if you think that it makes the expression more clear. And then if we look at this, this is kind of spurious. We don't need these outers, right? You know, we could have written it like that. That would have worked. And then honestly, we could have then written it like that. But just trying to set it up to show PEMDAS. You can override normal operator presence, precedence with the parentheses. Modulus remainder is equal in precedence to M and D. So if you have this expression, 5 times, or 5 plus 6 modulus 2, how does that get evaluated? This happens first. So 6 divided by 2 is 3 with a remainder of 0. So that would be evaluated as 5 plus 0, which is obviously equal to 5. Modulus means remainder. Read the book. Google it up if you don't remember what it does. So those get done first, and then... A dish, uh, multiplication, division, and modulus, which is the percent sign, and then addition and subtraction. I 
I don't see an exponent operator. I'm always disappointed when a language doesn't have an exponent operator, and the majority of them seem not to. I don't know why. Although this did support E for no entering um, scientific notation as a value of a double. Let's prove that to ourselves. Let's go back here and say that sum money is equal to 3.45 E to the 3. Now we have a lot more money, right? So if I run it, that's the change I made. All right, I now have $3,450. I'm much happier. So I, I just changed that to scientific notation. But that's not the same thing as, as uh, taking something to the power of, right? So we don't have that operator to us. We'll have a mathematical function where that does the same thing. Shortcut operators. You can use plus equals to add, minus equals to add, or to subtract, divide equals, times equals, that kind of thing. So let's go back to our code and let's give ourselves some more money. So underneath the line, double some money is equal to all that, do some money plus equals 10,000. Yay. But then some bad tax man comes along and divides our money in half. So some money divided by slash equals two. But then we go and we find an extra dollar on the street, and so some money plus plus. We get one more dollar out of it. So this adds 10,000 to our value, increases. Whoopsie, go away. I said go away. Really? By a frozen Visual Studio. Impressive. It's going to make me kill the app. Sorry about that. I had to kill it using the uh, the task manager. Relaunch Visual Studio. That was highly annoying. Go back to my last project. So open. How come it's not listing my most recent solutions? Recent. It's got recent files, but not recent solutions. And it's all gone. I guess I never saved my project, and so it lost it when it froze. Does it not save it on start? I mean, run it. Should have. Where did my uh, C sharp file go? Documents. Visual Studio. Projects. Projects. Uh -oh. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> All right, there's something I'm not understanding here. File new project. Windows, C Sharp, console application, name console application one. I think it's got mine saved in the user oh. app data or temporary oh, yeah. projects. All right, let me go look there. Yeah, if I go to uh, My Solution Explorer, which now seems to be on the left-hand side rather than the right-hand side, and I do right-click. Are you trying to get the file location? Yeah, where's the, the file location? It should be Open and Explorer. Open folder and File Explorer. It's in Temporary Projects. It, so it was lost. Lesson learned. Always do a file. How do you save your project when you're done with that? This is ridiculous. What happens if I just quit? Do you wish to discard changes to your current solution? Save them all. Now it's asking me for the project in a project folder. Ew, boy. Alrighty. 
So from now on, when I launch Visual Studio, the first thing I'm going to do is to make my new project. That's got to be different on uh, 2017. Go into it. and then do save all and it'll ask me for the name of the project okay so this was September 6's work alright let's go ahead and do the short assignment the tutorial so I'm gonna go back go out here it's gonna be pretty short because it just does pretty much what we've done it's just throwing in uh, asking for some input and it seems like we've kinda of done this already but a console application we're gonna come here Here's our documentation for what we want to do. So we're going to create a new C-sharp project, name it Tutorial 4, choose Console Application, and then immediately do Save All. I need to add that to the instructions. So here we go. We're going to do that. Launch a new project. File, new project. This is a tutorial 4, so it's a console application name is going to be tutorial 4. Click OK. Come over to File and do Save All. And there we go. We save all as tutorial 4, and now we actually have a project. It's not just a temporary project. And if you're doing this on Visual Studio 17, it may be a little bit different. I'm going to want to re-record this lecture. That was annoying. Okay, so we have some code that we want to enter. This is the same code that we used in our WPF application. You remember this, where we had a string of input, and then we parsed that input to turn it into a number, and then we squared it? Well, we're going to do the same thing. I wish I'd made it so we could just copy and paste it, but I didn't. So let's go ahead and type it in. And then we're going to wind up commenting some stuff out because these are all reference. Some of these things are references to stuff that only works in a WPF application. And I've said before I don't like having all these usings up here, so I'm going to delete them all except for using system. Okay, so we need two strings. String s in, s out. We need two doubles to hold our, re our values. Double D-I-N, D-O-U-T. And then sin is equal to text input dot text. Now that line's going to be an error. Why? Because we're not w doing a WPF application. We don't have a text box anywhere named text input dot txt. We're going to wind up commenting it out. I could just comment it out now, but I'm going to go ahead and type this code in as is. Now that we have that string, we want to parse it. So, bool bok is equal to, we're going to use the class double.tryParse, that input string. And what we're outputting it to. So out DIN. So the way we read this is that we are parsing SIN and then we're storing its output in the DIN variable. And if it was okay, if the value that was given to us was okay, so if be okay, or you could do if be okay is equal to true. Is that your, your happiness? Excuse me, two equals, like that. But of course, the equal equals true is superfluous. We can remove that. Then we want to calculate d out. d out is equal to dn times dn. We just squared the value. You're getting deja vu already. And now we need to create our output string. s out is equal to string.format. And here we get to use the same specifiers 
the same placeholders that we did before. So curly brace 0 in brace squared is curly brace 1 in brace end quote comma DIN comma D out. But if it wasn't okay, we need to set an error string. Else I'm not really digging that message box show. I know I'm gonna have to comment that out, but message box show message box dot show invalid, whatever. You know, I'm just gonna comment this out, so I'm not gonna take the time to type the whole string in. And then the output string, s out, is equal to, quote, invalid input, input must be a number. Like that. I'm going to reduce the font size one click so that I can then get a few more lines of code. The last line of code in our WPF application was label output dot or just label output equals s out. Now we've got lots of red lines here. Why? Because we weren't working inside a WPF application. Why did I even have us type all this? Because conceivably we could have just copied out of the other application, pasted, and been done with it. So we're going to comment all the stuff that doesn't work out, and we're going to replace it with stuff that's appropriate for console apps. So we need to comment this line out. The sin equals text input. That one's got to go. But we do want some input, right? So sin is equal to, well, we need to tell them to enter a number first. So let's do a write, console.write, enter a number colon, space. And then sin is equal to console.readline. I'm torn. Do I put white space to make it easier to read? But that makes less of the text available on the screen at the same time. So this is what we added. We commented out the sin is equal to text input dot six, and we put this in here. Console dot write, enter a number, and sin is equal to console dot read line. All right, we fixed those errors, but we have a problem down here. Message box dot show. That just flat out doesn't work. So comment that out completely. Heck, delete it. There we go. We could delete this uh, sin is equal to text input dot txt too. So I'm going to do that. Then looky here, we've got one more error because we don't have a WPF text field called label output to display. So we're going to replace that with some console.write lines. Console.write line. We already have our output string defined as out, S out, so I'm just going to do that. And then we want to do our press any key to exit business. Console.write line. press any key to exit, and um, my instructions here suggest using read key rather than read line so that they can just hit anything, not just enter. Okay, so that's our entire application, and amazingly it still fit all on one screen. It's all part of the main method here. Let's build it and see if it works. Debug, I'm going to scroll this back over now. Debug rebuild solution, rebuild all succeeded, run it. Enter number, 36, 56, 56 squared is 3136. Let's type in a big number. This is a double after all. We could type in huge numbers. Enter a number. 
All right, 9.8 to the 15 is 9.7 to the 31st. Well, I believe it. Okay, so we have a console application here that asks for a value, stores it in a string, parses it to make it a double. So what you're going to do as your homework is you wrote a program that multiplies two values based on a WPF application. Write a console app that asks for two values. Just ask for value one, ask for value two. Multiply those two values together and display the result. So that shouldn't be too hard. It's going to follow the same general thing as this, except instead of just having one input, you know, you're going to have two inputs. DIN1 and DIN2, or X and Y, whatever you want. All right, let's conclude this lecture, and we will pick back up in the next one. Any questions? Um, tutorial B, are we uploading these to the same Dropbox? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything we did today, go ahead and upload into the Tutorial D Dropbox. Really, specifically, I want this one, this uh, program that we wrote just, we wrote here. But if you have the other one lying around, please upload it as well.